Okay, welcome to Art History 1. Uh, some of you are taking this class online and some of you are taking this class uh, in a seated capacity, but I am uploading the recorded lectures later so that you can go back and review for tests and things. So you should have heard a version of this lecture in the class, but you are now getting a recorded lecture. Um, and some of you are just people on the internet who keep watching uh, lectures from my history class and then being confused because some of the information is delivered via different things. So anyway, welcome to Art History with me. I'm Megan Rosen. Uh, I'm an instructor uh, at Ozarks Technical Community College and I teach art and art history classes. So for Art History 1, we cover kind of a ton of information. Um, we start all the way, way back in the uh, Paleolithic era, uh, talking 40,000 plus years ago, and we go all the way up through the High Gothic or Rayonant period. Uh, so it's a lot of information in a short amount of time. This first unit I call Early, Early Days, and in it we're going to talk about Paleolithic art, dip into Mesolithic a little bit, and then get into Neolithic. And um, I'm going to break up these lectures. So this first one in this unit is just going to be focused on the Paleolithic. So here we go, part one, Early, Early Days. And I mean like really early days, okay? So the thing is people have been making art forever since before people were technically what we now know as people. So um, art making practices date back to um, predecessors of Homo sapiens. That's what you and I are. We're Homo sapiens. That's the kind of um, creature we are. Um, so we have many, many tens of thousands of years of art history to cover in this class. It's impossible for me to cover everything, but I, I do my best to kind of breeze through some of the highlights of prehistoric art history today. Um, we're specifically going to look at work from the Paleolithic and Neolithic, though as I said I'm going to split these lectures up because it's kind of long. So today we're really just looking uh, in this lecture at the Paleolithic. And um, we're going to look at those periods in different places around the world. So we're going to look at Africa, Europe, Asia, and South America. Um, then we're going to look at work from some very early civilizations in the Near East, a little bit in Western Europe as well, but mostly we're going to look in the uh, Fertile Crescent. Um, after this lecture, our topics are going to be a little bit more specific, and I'm not, I'm going to go more into depth in each area, but this is me trying to cover like 40,000 years of stuff. Um, so let's go through and look at the dawn of civilization and the emergence of art. So here are the different things that this lecture and the next one, the Neolithic lecture, are going to cover. Paleolithic art in Africa, Western Europe, Asia, South America, Neolithic art in the Near East and some Western Europe, and then some of these very early civilizations in the Near East and their uh, cultural contributions, architecture, and artwork. So the Sumerians, the Akkadians, the Neo-Sumerians, the Babylonians, the Hittites, the Alamites, the Assyrians, the Neo-Babylonians, the Achaemenid Persians, and the Sasanians. Okay, so kind of a lot of people that we're going to cover. All right. So, part one, Paleolithic art. Let's look at what this, this word means, what I mean by this. Another um, name for this period is the Stone Age, okay? Paleolithics, lithics meaning stone. Um, so first, we're gonna start with Paleolithic art in Africa. Most likely, um, though there are some new challengers that we're going to talk about today, uh, specifically coming out of Asia, but it is very much thought that the oldest art in the world comes out of Africa. Um, one of the reasons that we see less representation of that work is that a lot of the work, very, very early Paleolithic, Paleolithic work coming out of Africa, was portable. It was sculptural. It was smaller. It was on things that could be moved. The other reason is uh, colonization and uh, racism, right? So a lot of art history, even as recently as when I was an undergraduate taking art history, just a lot of the work is very much focused on Western Europe. A lot of art history is kind of European centric. It's very Eurocentric. Um, that's sort of the nature of how it's been taught forever. And I try to not do that as much. I try to kind of uh, be more inclusive in terms of art history and, and where things come from. But a lot of the work coming out of Africa was smaller and more portable and has been lost to time. Because again, we're talking about tens and thousands of years. 
So here uh, is an example of work that we do have that still exists that's from Africa that's very, very, very old. So this is an example of one of these slabs that were found in Apollo, a cave called the Apollo 11 cave. It's in Namibia in Africa. And um, these were these slabs, as you can see, that have been broken, that have very early drawings of animals on them. And this is very, very old. This is around 35,000 years old. Okay, a lot of the work that we suspect has been lost to time that was coming out of Africa that was very, very old um, are things like this. So this is a human face sculpture. It was found in South Africa in Makipan Scott. Uh, and it's carved out of red jasperite, and it's a carving of a human face. This is very small. This is a very small little carving. But you can see that representations of the human face have been created very, very, very far back. And we trace a lot of that very early artistic um, interest in development and expressive development back to Africa. This is a more... Uh, Recent discovery to for, for me personally, I, I would, didn't know anything about this particular kind of work until very recently. So this is fascinating to me. Um, recently, a bunch of these have been um, unearthed in the Western Cape of South Africa. And these are segments of ancient ostrich eggs, okay? So very, very old, 60,000 year old ostrich eggs that you can see people have carved into, have engraved these decorative kind of marks on. And, and we don't totally know what these were used, used for, but it could be that the eggshell kept mostly in, intact could have been used for a bowl or something like this. But it's this very, very early, very old decorative art that they're now finding uh, evidence of and finding examples of, which is pretty rad. This is a uh, more recent, this is only like uh, around 9,000 years old. Um, painting, when we paint, when we see paintings or drawings on cave walls or in rock cliffs, that's called parietal art. Parietal art is a word that's going to come up. You want to like flag that in your brain. That's going to be on a vocabulary quiz later. So this is an example of parietal art where this painting of wildlife was done on a cave wall. This was found at uh, Matabo National Park in Zimbabwe. And this is also a little bit more recent. This is about 9,000 years old. And this is another um, example of parietal art where we have five human figures who have been painted on the wall. And this was found in Algeria. I know I'm going fast. There's just a lot of things to go through. So I just kind of want to get you a sense of uh, what a lot of this work looks like. And then we're going to think about it a little bit more in depth as we get sort of in this mindset. But one thing to think about is putting yourself back this far, if you can. Um, you're probably, a lot of you are too young to have even seen the movie Ice Age, but the cartoon movie Ice Age, thinking back to, to that time period, that's when humans really came on the scene. So we're talking like woolly mammoth age pieces of artwork that still exist today that we can see that were done tens and tens of thousands of years ago, which is kind of incredible when you think about it, right? Okay, so next we're going to uh, jump across the ocean and take a look at some Paleolithic art in South America. Okay, so this is an example. This is a great example. It's about 12,500 years old, so a little bit recent, again, in, in terms of Paleolithic history. This is from uh, Cerro Azul in Colombia in South America, and it's this kind of incredible um, cave overhang where there's just hundreds of these these drawings all done in this kind of red um, paint on on the ceiling and the wall. Here's another example from the same cave. So you can see that there are sort of humanoid depictions. There are also some things that look like animals. But the thing that's really interesting and exciting to me are these sort of abstract decorative works. So these little um, concentric circles in the in the lower right, which that might be part of a tree or something. It's kind of hard to tell. These sort of zigzag patterns. And this connects back, in my mind, to what we're seeing in Africa many, many years prior, which are these decorative sort of lines on these ostrich shells. So it's really fascinating to me to think about not just prehistoric people representing what they see, so doing drawings of animals or other people or things like this, but doing things that are purely decorative, um, because we think of abstract 
painting and abstract work as a higher level of kind of conceptual thought. And a lot of times the kind of old school thought is that that doesn't develop until way, way, way later, like post enlightenment. So the fact that these early, early homo sapiens and some Neanderthals are, are doing this kind of abstract representation and decorative work is pretty cool and is kind of contrary to what was thought about early humans uh, for a long time. Um, this is another example from that same cave. I just love all these little images. And these are interesting to me because they have a kind of relationship, which we're going to go into Egyptian art later, but it kind of feels like um, hieroglyphics a little bit, right? Like you could see that it might even be narrative. We don't know that it's narrative, but there's the potential that it could be something that's trying to be almost an early form of writing or uh, communication. Um, this is in Argentina. This is about 11 thousand years old. And keep this one in mind because you'll see the same technique when we look at some work from uh, Europe, which is fascinating to me that these people divided by an ocean far, far away from each other are using the same kind of creative techniques. So how they do this is they put their hand on the wall and then chew up the pigment in their mouth. So whatever they're using, whether it's uh, ochre or um, charcoal or uh, clay or whatever, they chew it up in their mouth and then they're spitting it going... <laughs> Uh, around their fingers, so using their hand as a stencil. And it's really fascinating because in some caves, they the archaeologists have been able to identify different people's handprints, and so identify that same artist working in different places in the cave, which is really fascinating, right? So it's kind of leaving this, this extra information. There's also been some recent speculation that because of the size of the hands, um, that a lot of the early artists were actually women, uh, not men, as was previously thought. It's very hard. I mean, that's very speculative. It's hard to tell exactly what um, who was doing this, obviously, because we're removed by many, many thousands of years. But it's really interesting the amount of information archaeologists are able to derive from this kind of uh, information. Okay, so now we're going to hop uh, over to Asia and Australia. Um, and so I said that uh, the long-term thought had been that the earliest work, most of it which has been lost to history, um, was coming out of Africa. Well, very recently, this um, cave called uh, Liang Tidong uh, was found on Sulawesi, which is an island in Indonesia. And the work being found there dates earlier than other parietal art that's been seen in Africa, and earlier than most uh, parietal work ever seen. Um, and it may not be older than some of the smaller statue kind of work coming out of Africa, but in terms of cave painting, in terms of painting on walls, it is the oldest in the world. So we have, this is uh, 45,000 years old, and this is a depiction of a pig. And again, you'll see this is all the way over in Indonesia, but that same technique, this hand stencil technique that we saw in South America is being used here. This is from China. So this is a little bit more recent. It's a 13,000 year old um, deer antler fragment that has been carved. And again, you'll notice the carving on here is purely decorative. This isn't something that's depicting another kind of animal or a person or anything. Um, and most likely it's thought that this was a um, atolatl or a spear thrower, so a, a device that was used to help uh, throw spears further. Um, this is from Australia. So we have, uh, this is a relatively new discovery of um, a new kind of land rock art style. These are again a little bit more recent. They're not as old as the, the work in Indonesia, but they're still thousands of years old. So we can see we have these kind of humanoid uh, figures being depicted. There's also something that looks like a snake. And I just love this particular detail, this little creature. Um, I don't know what he is, but I think he's sort of darling. So <laughs> I just include him in there. Um, okay, now we're gonna go to Western Europe. And admittedly, I have more slides here than, than the other areas that we've talked about. And part of that is just because of the availability of information. This work has just been studied more and it's uh, there's more readily available information. The other thing is that most of the work that we have coming out of Western Europe has been discovered inside caves. So I don't know how much you know about caves, but um, for example, in the States, 
caves all are 58 degrees all the time year round and they're kind of a closed environment so things are preserved better because of uh, the consistent environment and also they're harder to access some of them particularly some of the caves we're about to look at in western europe so a lot of the artifacts and artwork has remained untampered with and has remained in place to be studied so when i took ice age art uh back a million years ago when i was an undergrad we kind of only i not kind of we've only talked about um the work in western europe and it's fascinating and beautiful and i, I love it but I, I do like to try and include some other perspectives and other information as well okay so this uh beginning slide is an image from a cave we're going to talk about a lot today uh called lasco this is in france a lot of what we're going to look at um are works found in France, Spain, and Germany. So Lasco is my personal favorite in terms of Paleolithic art. I think it's some of the most beautiful work in the world, <laughs> uh, contemporary, ancient, whatever, which is kind of funny because my kind of area of expertise and my, my favorite area is abstract expressionism, which is the mid 20th century large abstract painting. But I absolutely love the cave paintings at uh, Lasco. Uh, I think they're extremely beautiful and extremely advanced. So um, the person I took Ice Age art, Paleolithic art with, um, is a wonderful professor who I absolutely love and, and was one of my favorite professors in college. And he is pretty unique and fabulous because he was able to actually go into Lasco. They don't let people go in anymore. It's been completely closed since like the 60s, I think, because they're afraid that it will damage the work that's there. So only certain archaeologists and special people who study it are allowed in. Well, Tom, my uh, professor, Tom Parker, wrote the French government a letter asking to be let in to study it as an art critic. And they'd never had anyone take that approach before. They had all these biologists and all these people who wanted to study archaeology and all this stuff right from all over the world. And the French were like, no, our people that we have assigned are allowed in, nobody else. But because Tom wanted to go in as an art critic and write about the work from a culturally significant art historical perspective, that was something that no one had ever suggested before and they were pretty into it. So he was able to go and spend like a week going through the cave and looking at all these fabulous drawings with the archaeologist, which is pretty awesome. So I got to learn about this cave from someone who saw it firsthand, which is pretty neat. Uh, there's tons of information about Lasco available online and and it, in library books and everything. And it's really fantastic. But I want to look at it the same way that Tom did from an art historical art critic kind of perspective. So what's incredible to me about this work is the sense of um, perspective and the sense of movement that is captured here. So we're talking 17,000 years ago. This is before writing. This is before, um, really before civilization. It's before agriculture. It's before people sort of settled down into societies. So we have these nomadic people moving around, but they understand these complex kind of ideas that we, uh, that I teach in drawing one, you know, that, that aren't things that people naturally understand. They're things that have to be worked out. So if you look at this, you, you see these two bowls, right, in the center kind of looking at each other. And then we have this kind of background of these horses who are running. And we have even further in the distance, these reindeer or caribou or something with antlers. And the overlapping of these figures to show perspective is a concept that humans forget they forget how to do it. We don't see it again until the ancient Greeks, and then they forget it again in the, the Middle Ages, and we don't see it again until the Renaissance. So this is a very advanced idea about perspective that Paleolithic age humans, tens of thousands of years ago, understood. The other thing I love about it is just how expressive and beautiful the line work is. Um, if you take Art History 2 with me, We'll talk about a guy that you've probably heard of named uh, Picasso, Pablo Picasso, and he's a famous painter, obviously, who did, um, he's one of the inventors uh, and pioneers of cubism, but he also did these fabulous prints and drawings, a lot of them in which he's uh, sort of metaphorically depicting himself as a bull, and his line work is very beautiful and very simple, but it always reminds me of Lasco, of this cave. And I feel like there's something in the human brain that has this kind of uh, simplicity and appreciation of beautiful line work. Um, so they're really fabulous. Here are just some more images. So we have 
a bull and a little spotted horse. We also have, you see all these little dots? Those are from the heel of uh, a hand, so dotting like that. This other little uh, horse, which reminds me of the really beautiful carved jade Chinese horses that come about many thousands of years later. And then on the right, we have this, the shaman. This is in a very difficult part of the cave to get to. It's very far in the cave and you have to kind of um, rappel down into this uh, sort of um, well-like shape almost. And so we have this shaman, is what he's called, who is, it looks like he's laying on the ground in front of this bison. Um, and he has a direct penis, and then he has this staff, this bird staff on the side. So the idea is that this might have been some kind of ritual being portrayed, maybe some kind of fertility ritual or something. They have no idea. They don't really know what it is. But this is the only humanoid um, drawing portrayal within this particular cave. So it's kind of fascinating. Here's just a close-up of that first image, and then going in even closer on one of these um, I don't know, caribou or reindeer or something with these beautiful antlers. It's pretty fantastic. One of the other things that's amazing about Lascaux, so here's a view of a archeologist within the cave, is the way they think about perspective, not just in terms of how they're portraying the animals, but about how it would be viewed by people. So imagine you're going into this cave, tens of thousands of years ago, you have a torch, and as you walk in, you're enclosed in this kind of hall, this kind of rounded chamber. So your torchlight is going to illuminate different parts of the cave at a time. And the, the artists who created this were very cognizant of that experience, and they've really made kind of an experiential installation. So you're walking through, and it's like these creatures are stampeding along either side of you. And the way they're drawn in relation to the surface of the rock, the cave, makes them have a feeling of three-dimensionality, three-dimensionality, excuse me, as the light catches them on those raised areas as you walk through. So it's really an incredibly sophisticated portrayal and was kind of designed to be a sort of experiential um, artwork, which is pretty wild. Okay, let's go to Spain. So this is older than Lascaux. This is about 35,000 years old. And this is in the Altamira cave in uh, Spain. which it, It's in Santa Lana del Mar in Spain. But you can see there's some similarities in the way this creature is portrayed. So this is some kind of buffalo or bison. And what I love is the little detail, the way the red ochre is used to create uh, the hide. And then you have these little line work in uh, charcoal to show the hooves and to show the kind of fringing of the fur down its chest and its horns. And again, in the same cave, in Altamira Cave in Spain, we have the stencil work again. We have the stenciled hands. So again, this is something that um, seems to be kind of universal because we've seen it now in South America. We've seen it in Australia. We have seen it in uh, France and now we're seeing it in Spain as well. This is a fabulous movie. It's on, you can watch it if you have Amazon Prime, you can watch it online. I'm maybe gonna try to find a clip of it on YouTube or something that I can share with you. But I don't know if you know Werner Herzog, probably most of you. He's a famous document, documentary making filmmaker. He's a wonderful voice, wonderful German accent. You probably, if you're familiar with him, I would guess that you might know him from um, the Baby Yoda TV show, the, um, uh, oh, my kids would be so mad at me. What's Oh, The Mandalorian. So in The Mandalorian, the guy from the Empire who, like, hires Mando to go get the Grokul Gook, whatever his name is, the Baby Yoda, that has the, like, heavy accent, is, let me see the baby, I want to see the baby. That guy's Werner Herzog. So he's a famous director who acts in things occasionally. So that guy from The Mandalorian, about, mm, I th not quite 20 years ago, made this movie called Cave of Forgotten Dreams, and it's, I love it, it's amazing. I just rewatched it the other day and my husband watched it with me, um, and it's, it's pretty fantastic. So it's about uh, this cave called Chauvet Cave in uh, Ardèche, France, and so he, um, kind of like my professor, Tom Parker, he approached the French government and was like, I know that only certain archeologists and scientists are allowed into this cave and it's sealed from the public and all of this, but I don't want to go in as a scientist. I want to go in as a filmmaker and showcase the artwork in this cave in a film. 
And so they let him do it. Uh, and it's the same kind of thing, like appealing from an artistic cultural standpoint. So it's a really fantastic movie. I'll try to get a clip of it that we can watch in class. But I want to look at some of the work. And because this movie exists, there's been a little bit more attention paid to this particular cave. So we have all these wonderful images. And it's incredible. It's just an... Uh, I would love to go there. It's just amazing. So, uh, okay, so Chauvet. So in Chauvet, this is 30,000 years old. It's older than Lascaux, about twice as old as Lascaux. So there's this one area called the Hall of Lions. And if you look at this, you can see this is a bunch of lions. And these aren't like our lions we have today in Africa. These are Paleolithic lions. And one of the things that's kind of amazing, we'll go into the perspective and everything in a minute, is that biologists who have studied in this cave were able to answer this question that they had, where these Paleolithic Ice Age tigers, or not tigers, sorry, lions, they didn't know if the male lions had manes or not because, you know, they have bones of them, but they don't have uh, fur, obviously, because they're 30,000 years old, so they, they didn't know. So they have all these bones, uh, and they know they were much larger than lions today because everything was bigger in the Ice Age, right? Except people, we were smaller. Uh, and so there's several drawings in this cave that show a clearly male lion with a clearly female lion, and the male lion does not have a mane. So they were able to figure out that this extinct species of animal, how it looked based on some of the drawings in this cave, which I think is pretty fabulous. I think it's a really neat detail. One of the other things that's amazing to me about this is, again, this idea of perspective, the way things are overlapped, the way that they're using the uh, surface of the cave to show kind of the uh, depth and the shape of what's happening. It's pretty incredible. It also is showing us that there was a large population of lions. There were a large number of lions in France, right? So this is lions in France at this time. There are also rhinoceroses. So these are Ice Age rhinoceroses, which were um, in Europe. And one of the things that's very interesting and fascinating to me about how these are depicted. First of all, we have this kind of action shot of two of them fighting. Then if you look in that upper, the kind of middle image up at the top, you see how the horn is depicted a bunch of times? That's to show movement. So this very advanced concept of capturing movement in a still drawing is being experimented with 30,000 years ago, which is something that doesn't come up in art again really until the early 20th century with the futurists. So that's pretty incredible. And here's just a, a further out perspective, a kind of zoom out on that wall so you can see all the lions coming this way. You can see the rhinoceros over here. You can see these things that look kind of like some kind of warthog or something. So it's pretty fabulous. You also can see a small elephant over there. So there are a couple depictions of elephants, which again, there were also mammoths, elephants, those kind of things were in uh, Europe at this time. Okay, now we're gonna shift gears a little bit away from parietal art and look at some sculptural work that's being done in the Paleolithic era. A lot of the great examples of sculptural work from this time period that have survived were found in Germany. And again, in Africa, we have a very hot climate. We have all this constant um, changing and moving of, of things and, and things aren't, uh, there aren't as many caves that things have been found in. Um, whereas in some of these caves in Germany and France and Spain, they've been essentially sealed. Chauvet was sealed for thousands and thousands of years because there was a rock slide that totally covered the entrance to the cave. Um, so everything was preserved inside. Similar situation in uh, Skelklingen, uh, Germany, where a lot of sculptural work has been found kind of sealed in this cave. Um, so this is Venus of Holofields, and it's carved out of mammoth ivory. So Holofields Cave is where we have a lot of... Um, artifacts like this, around 40,000 years old. All of these early sculptures of, of uh, female forms they call Venuses. I don't know, that's just kind of what they've been named. Uh, but it's really fascinating. And the other thing that's super interesting is these can be carbon dated, not just uh, based on the organic breakdown of the material, but also we, have, we know what kind of animal this is from. So this is ivory from the tusks of a mammoth, which is pretty cool. So you can see here, we have this depiction of a female form. Um, and we're going to look at several of these. Here's another one uh, that's found in Austria, in Willendorf, Austria. So we have the Venus of Willendorf. This is probably the most famous of these sculptures. You may have seen representations of it in, it's been represented in pop culture and stuff quite a bit. It's about 25,000 years old. 
the particular thing that I really like about this piece, first of all, it's kind of uh, interesting. I mean, she has her hands over her breasts like this. It's kind of a weird pose. Um, but the thing that I really like about it is if you look at her head, this kind of patterning on the head implies that she either has some elaborate sort of hair uh, design, like her hair has been braided around in some way, or maybe it is in some kind of a dreadlock situation, but it's some kind of texture, or she has some sort of net or hat that's been constructed that she's wearing, which thinking about that kind of accessorizing, whether it's the patterning of the hair itself, or it's some kind of thing, basket-like or, or woven thing that's placed on the head at 25,000 years ago, is pretty wild, right? We don't really think about that kind of interest. But again, it's like this sort of cultural, um, this, this level of cultural development that existed way before we thought it did. So she's pretty cool. This is another example um, from France. So this is around the same time period as, as the Venus of Willendorf. And again, we have this kind of elaborate patterning in the hair, which to me looks like braiding, but it could be, again, some kind of net, some kind of headdress. It could be uh, dreadlocks have that kind of texture. But what's fascinating to me is that someone is taking the time to carve this depiction and also capture this sort of fashion that's happening at the time, right? So this kind of texture is clearly the look 25,000 years ago, which is pretty cool information to have. It's, it's kind of amazing to think about. And here's just a cross comparison um, uh, between three of these similarly dated works. And you can see one thing that uh, definitely is depicted is uh, large breasts and large hips. So this idea, um, the, this is part of the reason these things tend to be thought of as fertility goddesses. Um, or it could just be that if you weren't starving to death, if you were could get enough food to be kind of voluptuous, maybe that was the thing. It's kind of the early origins of the Rubenesque form. This voluptuous form meant that you were kind of high society back in the day. You're eating well enough that you've got curves. Um, so it could have been this sort of idealized female figure. It could have been something about fertility. It could have been um, highly sexualized figures where we're emphasizing the, the, the sex organs and secondary sex organs. Um, but it's super fascinating to have things from 25,000 years ago that depict this kind of information. Uh, this is a relief carving. So this is uh, also in France and this, uh, it has been removed from the wall and preserved at this point, but this was carved into the rock. And it's interesting to look at to me because you have um, the same kind of body type, the same kind of representation here. And she's holding this artifact. So she's holding a carved, some kind of horn, or maybe it's something to, do, to drink out of. But it's fascinating because it's capturing this human utilizing a tool of some kind, and it's being documented directly into the stone. This is one of my favorite things. So this to me is super fascinating. This is in France, and these are carvings, relief carvings of bison, but they're not carved into hard stone. They're carved into the soft clay of the floor of the cave. So this is unbaked, unfinished clay. It'd just be like carving this out of mud that you found in a cave. And they've sat there undisturbed like that for 14,000 years. So you can actually see the fingerprints of the people who made them and the way they, they carved in to make the kind of figurines and, and made the little the little like fur distinctions. And I just think they're charming and beautiful and that it's incredible that they've sat there so well preserved, which is why we have a lot of things from caves because they've kind of sat undisturbed and, and just sort of hidden in there. And this I think is just sort of darling. So this is uh, another depiction of a bison found in that same cave in uh, Dordogne, France. And it's carved out of a reindeer horn and it was probably a handle for an atolatl. An atolatl is a spear thrower. It's this handle that helps you, you put a spear on it and then because of the um, added length you can throw the spear further. So there's lots of these carved atolatls that have been found around Europe. But I think it's just sort of darling. It's reaching back and licking its, its back or trying to get a fly or something. It just has a sort of sweet, expressive quality. This is a discovery that was relatively new um, to me. 
Um, I had not heard of this before until I was re-researching this um, presentation, but they found these all over. They found some in China, they think, but they're more fragmented, but they found whole flutes in Germany. So this is a flute carved out of a bone that's 35,000 years old, which means not only did these people have artwork, parietal art, the two-dimensional work on the cave walls, they have carvings, they have carved statues, they're doing headdresses or some kind of hair decoration, but they also have music. So these people, 35,000 years ago, were making music, which is incredible. And they had uh, in the Cave of Forgotten Dreams, the Werner Herzog film, there's an archaeologist who has one of these and plays it, and it's a very similar scale to a modern flute, which is mind-boggling to me. So here's another example of one of those. They found several of these and the best preserved ones have been uh, in Germany. So pretty crazy to think that music is over 40,000 years old, right? Uh, and then this is a book that just has a lot of great information. Um, it's a little bit dated and it, it does, it is very Eurocentric. It, it pretty much just talks about work in uh, particularly Western Europe. There's a little bit about some of the work coming out of Africa, um, but it has really great information, particularly about par parietal art, about the cave painting and cave art. So if you're looking for more information and want to read more about this, this is a book that I uh, recommend. Okay, so I'm going to stop there on this one, and then we'll come back and talk about Neolithic art next time but just to set you up for what happens next. Around 9,000 BC, the ice that covers most of Europe recedes. The reindeer migrate north. The mammoth and rhinoceros disappear from Europe. The climate grows warmer. And we have a little transition period called the Meso Mesolithic era, and then Neolithic art and the rise of civilization. All right, so we'll talk about that next time.